Even though metabolic rate is fundamentally a measure of energy consumption rate, metabolic rate is also a phenomenon based on the chemistry of metabolism. And this opens the door for various indirect ways of measuring an animal's metabolic rate. These ingenious methods often provide more experimental versatility and power than direct calorimetry methods do, and so it's not surprising that most measurements of metabolic rate to be found in the literature are actually based upon indirect calorimetric methods. Indirect calorimetry starts with the basic chemical equation for oxidation of fuels to energy. This chemical equation varies from fuel to fuel, a complication that we will come back to later. But for glucose and other hexoses, the basic equation boils down to this one. One mole of glucose plus six moles of oxygen are converted to six moles of carbon dioxide plus six moles of so-called metabolic water, plus about 2.8 megajoules of energy for every mole of glucose oxidized. Consequently, there is an unbreakable stoichiometric relationship between moles of oxygen consumed and joules of energy produced. This means that there will have to be a conversion between the molar consumption rate of oxygen, M dot sub O2, and the molar production rate of carbon dioxide, M dot sub CO2, and rate of energy production, E dot. It's this last quantity that's what we're interested in, namely the metabolic rate. So for carbohydrates, for every 6 moles of oxygen consumed per second, 2.8 megajoules per second of energy will be released. And for every mole of oxygen consumed, the energy production rate will be 2.8 megajoules per second divided by 6, or about 0.47 megajoules per second. That is to say 0.47 megawatts, or 470 kilowatts. That's a really high value, and we're only using this number to illustrate the calculation. For a more realistic comparison, the typical metabolic rate of an adult human is about 100 watts. This is the basis of the method of indirect calorimetry. By measuring an oxygen consumption rate, the stoichiometry of the oxidation of glucose provides us a reliable way of estimating the energy production rate, the metabolic rate, by measuring the oxygen consumption rate. We can make a similar argument for saying that we can measure metabolic rate by measuring the carbon dioxide production rate. That actually has some interesting complications, which we'll come back to a bit later. But for now, let's just stick to oxygen consumption rate as a proxy for metabolic rate. In practice, oxygen consumption rate is more easily measured as a volumetric oxygen consumption rate, V dot sub O2. That can be related to molar consumption rate of oxygen by the ideal gas law. Specifically, the product of molar consumption rate of oxygen and the ratio of the universal gas constant R, absolute temperature T, and the pressure P is the volumetric consumption rate. The stoichiometric relationship between oxygen consumption rate and energy production rate therefore allows us to substitute the molar consumption rate of oxygen with its stoichiometric equivalent of energy production rate, 0.47 megajoules per second. Thus, we have a direct relationship between volume consumption rate of oxygen and energy production rate of metabolism. There are typically two ways to measure metabolic rate through indirect calorimetry. Both involve a technique known as respirometry, which is simply the measurement of consumption or production of the respiratory gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen. One method is known as closed chamber respirometry. This technique places an animal like this mouse into a sealed chamber. The chamber is usually equipped with a manometer, which consists of a droplet of liquid placed in a long tube. We'll see the significance of this momentarily. As an animal consumes oxygen at a particular rate, it will also produce carbon dioxide at a rate determined by the stoichiometry of oxidation of the fuels being consumed. 
If the fuel is a carbohydrate, the rate of carbon dioxide production is equal to the rate of oxygen consumption. As the animal sits in this sealed chamber then, the quantity of oxygen in the air declines and the quantity of carbon dioxide increases. Because the removal of oxygen is offset by the addition of an equal volume of carbon dioxide, the total number of gas molecules in the atmosphere within the chamber stays constant, as does the volume of gas. Keep in mind that we're talking about metabolism of carbohydrates here, as an example, where the oxygen consumption rate is equal to the carbon dioxide production rate. In a typical closed chamber respirometer, however, the animal is suspended above a solution of strong alkali, usually saturated sodium hydroxide. This strong alkali solution ensures that carbon dioxide that is exhaled by the animal becomes dissolved in the water and is converted strongly to carbonic acid and carbonate. Remember the reaction of carbon dioxide with water and remember that the higher the pH, the more strongly will the reaction tend toward carbonate. Because the carbon dioxide exhaled by the animal is now being taken out of the gaseous phase and into solution, the removal of oxygen from the chamber by metabolism is now no longer being offset by the addition of carbon dioxide. Consequently, the quantity of gas molecules within the chamber, and therefore the volume of gas within the chamber, declines at a rate equal to the rate at which oxygen is being consumed by the mouse. Here's where the manometer comes in. As the volume of gas within the chamber declines, the liquid droplet moves along the manometer tube as the pressures between the inside of the chamber and the atmosphere are equalized. If we know the tube diameter and the distance the droplet has moved, we know the total volumetric consumption of oxygen. The principal advantage of closed chamber respirometry is its simplicity. There are new, no moving parts to get in the way, and it can be done in circumstances where there's no power to run machinery. One of the disadvantages of closed chamber respirometry, though, is that oxygen concentration within the chamber goes down with time. The longer the animal is in the chamber, the more the oxygen within the chamber will be reduced, and there's always the worry that this lowering oxygen concentration will have detrimental physiological effects and artifacts. Another method known as open chamber flow-through respirometry largely gets around this problem. This method is a bit more technologically complex than closed chamber respirometry is, but the principle is quite simple. Again, we start with an animal enclosed within a chamber, which is open at two ports. Air is made to flow through the chamber with a pump, which connects to a flow meter and then to something to dry the water vapor out of the air. Downstream from the chamber, air is made to flow through a device that can measure the oxygen concentration in the outflowing air, and then sequentially into a device that can measure the carbon dioxide concentration. The air is then exhausted from the system. Here's how this apparatus lets us measure respiratory gas exchange. The flow meter gives us a known volume flow rate of dry air into the chamber, V dot. The dry air flowing into the chamber consists of some proportion of oxygen and some other proportion of carbon dioxide. Consequently, the volume flow rate of dry air into the chamber consists of a known volume flow rate of oxygen in and a known volume flow rate of carbon dioxide in. We know from the composition of the atmosphere that the volume flow rate of oxygen in, V dot sub O2 comma in, will be 21% of the volume flow rate of dry air in, and the volume flow rate of carbon dioxide in, V dot sub CO2 comma in, will be about 0.04% of the volume flow rate of dry air. As air flows through the chamber, the animal will consume oxygen for metabolism at some rate, V dot sub O2 comma M, and it will produce carbon dioxide at some rate, V dot sub CO2 comma M. 
by simple conservation of mass, because some of the oxygen is being extracted by the animal, this will produce a change in the volume flow rate of oxygen out, V dot sub O2 comma out. Similarly, the addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by the animal will also produce a change in the volume flow rate of carbon dioxide out, V dot sub CO2 comma out. A simple analysis will show that the metabolic oxygen consumption will simply be the difference between the volume flow rate of oxygen in and the volume flow rate of oxygen out. Along similar lines, the metabolic carbon dioxide production rate will be the difference between the volume flow rate of carbon dioxide out and the volume flow rate of carbon dioxide in. The principal advantage of this method is that it maintains oxygen concentrations and carbon dioxide concentrations within the chamber at a constant level. There's a bit of art to this technique because one needs to balance volume flow rates through the chamber against sensitivity of the instruments and the metabolism of the animal, but that is simply a matter of technique that needn't really concern us here. These methods of indirect calorimetry have proven to be very powerful tools in the hands of biologists interested in understanding how energy metabolism works in animals. Before we get to those interesting things though, we have to explore another method of indirect calorimetry which solves a problem that exists for both closed chamber respirometry and for open flow chamber respirometry. Namely, these techniques require that an animal be enclosed in a chamber or otherwise somehow restrained. For example, if you have an animal that's too large to fit into a respirometry chamber, you can do flow through respirometry by simply outfitting the animal with a flow through mask that captures the exhaled gases. Even though the animal is not confined within a chamber, it still needs to be restrained somehow though. So let's now outline an intriguing method of indirect calorimetry that allows one to measure metabolic rate in unrestrained animals in natural conditions.